today is the day when we remember the baptism of our Lord. It's an important occasion. It's an important event, apparently, and has always been for the church because it's in all four of the Gospels. And so I want to talk about that, but I don't want us to lose sight completely of Epiphany, which was only yesterday, and the coming of the wise men, the, the Magi, this thing that, that we celebrated last night very briefly, a small number of us who were here in the midst of rain and, and storm in the winter. Uh, but th I think it's important to see these two stories as being part of the same thing. I think these are forces that collide on these two occasions but they're getting at the same basic issue that you and I face also in our lives. And it can be summed up as, how do you go public? And begin with yesterday and with the, the Feast of the Epiphany. If you think about it, up to yesterday, Christmas has been kind of a private thing. There's Mary and Joseph and the baby Jesus, and there are a few hangers-on who've been around, the, the rough people who are in that neighborhood. But that's about it. It really hasn't been proclaimed to the world yet. That's what happens when the Magi appear in the scene. Now suddenly the world has come, people who've come from far away. We have no idea who these people were, if these people were, but if we take the story for what it's meant to tell us, by tradition in Western art, they're portrayed as coming from Africa and from Asia, from far away, people who were not Jews, so who would not have known what the prophecies were necessarily, but have somehow come to this realization that God is doing something new in the world, and they have come to see it. And I want to emphasize that point. These are probably religious people. Uh, we really know nothing. They are like most characters in most biblical stories. They enter, do their thing, and exit again, and we never hear of them again. Now, of course, the church has encrusted them with lots and lots of legends ever since. They went on to be bishops. They were important in the church. Somehow their relics, although we don't know how, ended up first in Milan and then were borrowed by some Germans at some point and ended up in the cathedral in Cologne, which is where they still are to this day. You can go see the reliquary of the three kings in the cathedral there. But we don't know if any of that is true. All we do know is that they probably were people who we're looking for what it was that God was doing in the world. I want that to be clear before I begin besmirching their characters. Because think about what happens in the story. The first thing that happens to them in the story is they take a wrong turn. They're headed to Bethlehem, but where do they end up first? In Jerusalem, with Herod the king. I've only just gotten done telling you lately that Herod didn't have a really firm grip on power. He didn't really deserve to have the job. The Romans kind of propped him up. So he and all the people who were eating at his trough around him were a little nervous all the time. Here come these bizarre foreigners saying, oh, by the way, a king's been born someplace. Have you heard about it? We're going to find it. Tell us where. And Herod and his, his followers, his, his circle of people, are a little nervous about this. And so they try to, what, co-opt the wise men, these magi, these, these gullible foreigners. Well, yeah, we want to know too. Why don't you go find out and then come back and tell us so we can go and worship too? Already we have the first hints of the world noticing this thing that God has done and trying to react in the way that the world reacts. We know, living after the fact, what it is by tradition that Herod did in fact do, which was try to kill everybody who might have been Jesus. So we can see where that story would have gone, perhaps even sooner, had the Magi, in fact, done what it was Herod wanted and gone back and reported. But of course, they didn't. They go on their own way and don't go back. But then what they do do is they leave Herod and Jerusalem, and they do go, in fact, find Jesus and his parents. And there's where we get the next piece of the world, because then we see what it is that they do. They present gifts. What are the gifts that they give? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gold is pretty obvious. That's wealth. Gold is valuable only because you can exchange it for something else of value. So here comes the world offering God wealth. Can you see this is only going to get better? Next is frankincense. It's burnt in front of idols. It's burnt in religious ceremonies, but it's also burnt in front of kings. It's a symbol of worldly power, influence. 
the ability to direct events in the world, however you do it, whether it's divinely or by human means. So the world comes and offers God power. And then there's myrrh. Have you ever smelled myrrh? I hadn't. Uh, I didn't even know if it was a real thing, but then I looked it up online. And of course, on the internet, you can find anything, so I bought some and I burned it. And it, the smell is, is very strong. It's very memorable. It's not really very pleasant. Certainly not as pleasant as frankincense is when you burn it. But the purpose of myrrh, of course, was mainly the preparation of dead bodies. So I guess any strong smell that would compete with the smell of decay was worth having around on those occasions. So the world presents God with death. Wealth, power, and death. These, dear friends, are about all that the world has to offer to anyone, God or anyone else. And in that way, the world tries to say to God, well, you're doing this new thing, and here's how we're going to box it in. Here's how we're going to constrain it, categorize it, limit it in some way so that we know what it's about and perhaps it can be of some benefit to us. That, of course, never has happened in the 2,000 years since when any government or ruler has found that the church had a certain amount of power or a certain amount of wealth or a certain amount of anything that was valuable and has tried to use it for his or her or their own purposes. This is what the world does as in when God goes public. This is how the world tries to rationalize what it is God does and make it something that the world can understand and contain. And before we get to feeling too smug, dear friends, if you want to take the world out and put us in our less lovely moments in that sentence, it works for that too. There are plenty of times when we would like to take the blessings we have received from God and use them mainly for our own purposes, for our own benefit, in service of our own goals. So if there's one story. The other story is the baptism of Jesus. As I say, it's a very important story because there are very few that appear in all four of the Gospels. I mean, the birth of Jesus does not even appear in all, all four of the Gospels. But the baptism of Jesus does. And in all four versions, we hear some reference to what happens after Jesus is actually gotten wet. The heavens open. Some sign of God's blessing is apparent. And there is a message that Jesus is beloved of God. This also is a beginning. Up to this point, Jesus has been a private person. We have only a couple of perhaps shaky stories about what happens to Jesus between the manger and this baptism scene. There's the flight into Egypt, and there's the story of the young adolescent Jesus in the temple. Aside from that, he's been doing his thing for probably 30 years, but now he's going public. And it must have been a question in other people's minds around him. Perhaps it was even a question in his own mind. What would his ministry be about? What was the public Jesus going to be like? I don't know about you and me, but we don't necessarily know what we would do in a circumstance until we're in it. Anyone who's been ordained will, will tell you, you don't really know what you're like until you put the collar on. Deacon Sheila probably did, but the rest of us, we're not quite sure. Who knows exactly what was going through Jesus' mind? We can never know the psychology of Jesus, but somehow this is a beginning. And it's in another occasion where a, a, a meaning, a, a quality can be put on that beginning, and this time God shows you the way God wants it done. Not with worldly power, not with whatever the world can throw at it, but rather with the way God intends this thing to work, which is to say, in terms of a relationship. This is my child. This is someone I'm related to. Someone I love. And whatever happened before, what happens during, what happened after, whatever does or doesn't happen, that relationship endures. 
that love, that relating, no, there's no other word I can think of in English, that, that way that we are in contact with each other will not change and it will color everything else that comes after this. Makes you go back and read that first chapter of the Gospel of John differently. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God from the very beginning. This has been the way it works. Whether that message is sent just to Jesus, to everyone else who's around Jesus in that moment, God is proclaiming what going public is going to mean. It's going to mean loving, living in the love and mercy of God, no matter what may happen. Whatever joys and sorrows may follow, that bedrock piece of the relationship will never change. Now we have two images for you and for me. Now in this season of Epiphany, when we're talking about new light and new beginnings. Not just in this season. This is the, the, the theme of our lives. This is the theme of every day of our lives. Every time a new opportunity arises for us, which is to say, every time we wake up in the morning, we are presented with this choice. Will we respond to the blessings God has given us in a worldly way, with restrictions, with limitations, with fears, responding in a way that is aimed mainly at self-preservation? Or will we respond in the light of the relationship that has always existed between us and God if only we would stop and notice it? A relationship of love and mercy, of abundance, of overflowing blessing that will continue no matter what happens today, no matter what doesn't happen today. That will always be there. That's really all there is. That, that, that I could say amen and sit down. That's the only, only thing about it that we have to choose. How will we respond? Now, I know I can see a few people saying, well, yeah, that's nice, but that's never that simple, is it? I'll say, this week I had an example of that. We, St. Thomas's, are applying for a grant through the United Thank Offering of a significant amount of money for the uh, new underground railroad initiative projects that Father Clay has been talking about. And we're now actually coming to the brass tacks of paying for it. And it does get a little icky when you're looking at it reduced to just a budget. Well, this costs this dollars, and we're going to buy that many things. So it was good that, in fact, the budget was done as a narrative. So when we're talking about a 25% person, what in, in crude business terms is a full-time equivalent. We're not even people. They're, they're, they're units. We become units in budgets. At least there's a description of what that person will do, how that person will work with other people, how that person will build relationships, how that person will be a mentor how that person will do this, that, or the other thing, and then what the equipment will do, too. It isn't just a, a box that sits on the floor. It serves a purpose. I think as we go through our lives and must confront the realities of the world, the things that are thrown at us all the time, that's the key. Keep writing that narrative under it, a narrative in terms of love, a narrative in terms of justice a narrative in terms of abundant mercy. If we will do that, I think our choices will become easier, more obvious, more godly. And day by day, we also will be able to new, make new beginnings in the full light of what it is that God desires for each one of us, which is that relationship that endures. Amen.